good day to you and welcome to the Revival Train. Now remember this train is going to take you and me all the way to heaven. I want to speak to you today about the enemy. Now where is the real enemy? I'll tell you where it is. It's in the mind. That's where it is. That's right. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. This battle that you are fighting at the moment is not a physical battle. It is a spiritual battle, and it's a battle of the mind. And I really want to emphasize that. That is the message which the Lord Jesus Christ has given me for you and I for this revival train. You see, this revival train is going through uncharted territory. But it's taking you and I with it. And the revival train is taking us home to heaven. But in the meantime, we have got to fight the good fight. We have got to run the race. And we've got to finish strong. There's no good bailing off the train halfway. Because the going is getting too tough. There is no plan for that. Remember, we always say this revival train is not going backwards. It's got no reverse gear and it has got no U-turn. It is a holy train. What is holiness? Holiness is the end product of obedience. When we start obeying the Word of God and start operating in the power of the Word of God, then we become obedient people and automatically we are holy people. And that is what this train is. It's a holy train. It's a train of no compromise. You can't serve two masters. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30. He said, he who is not for me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters abroad. You cannot be in two camps. You cannot sit on the fence. Either we're going to fight this fight with the Lord, or we're going to fight this fight without the Lord. If you try and fight this fight without the Lord, you are going to lose. I'm telling you now. I tried it. It does not work. I tried it for 32 years. And I was getting pummeled. Every round I was getting knocked down. Until I gave my life to Christ and he came into my corner. And then we gave the devil the thrashing of his life. I want to know, I'll ask you a question. Are you doing that? Or are you just bashing away there, trying to defeat the enemy on your own. You won't do it. If we go to the Word of God in Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 19, you know the Scripture very well, but you really need to understand it today. When the enemy, that's the devil, listen carefully, when the enemy comes in like a flood, maybe you just can't handle it. I mean, it's just huge. Maybe you've uh, just lost a loved one. Maybe your business is going down. Maybe you've got no work. Maybe you are sick. Maybe you're in a situation where your loved one has been unfaithful to you. And there's a tidal wave coming over you. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Ghost, will lift up a standard against him. And he won't go any further than that. The Spirit of the Lord. The weapons of our warfare are not fleshly. But they are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. The battle is in the mind. The battle is not a battle of flesh. Some of us are fighting each other at home, husband and wife. The battle is not a fleshly one. The devil wants to break your marriage down. I'm telling you now. He hates marriages. Why? Because Jesus loves marriages. He wants to destroy the family. Why? Because God loves the family. The first family that ever was, was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The first family. And the devil hates families. Because when families pull together, there is power and strength, and he cannot compete. So he starts to break you down, and you think it's a physical thing. It's not. It's a mental battle. And your biggest enemy and my biggest enemy is ourselves. It's not the other person. It's Angus. You cannot fight on your own. It takes two to tango, as the old saying goes. You can't dance on your own. 
You need somebody else to dance with. You need somebody else. Now, if you say, I'm not fighting. I'm going to pray. I'm not fighting. There cannot be a fight. You say, but must I just sit there and be like a, a, a doormat that I get walked over? No, I didn't say that. But what I am saying is that the battle is done in the prayer room. Early in the morning, that's when the fight takes place. You bring your loved one before the Lord. You bring that rebellious child before the Lord. You bring that work situation before the Lord. Some of you I'm talking to you now, I know it. The Holy Spirit has shown me you hate going to work because you cannot get on with your workmates. It's not even the boss. Pray. Pray that the Lord Jesus Christ will lift up a standard against the devil. There's another beautiful scripture just a couple of chapters before. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17, you know it as well. But we're talking about the enemy, the real enemy. We're not talking about a government. We're not talking about a, a political leader. We're not talking about a, a disease, a virus. No, we are talking about the devil himself. He comes in different forms, you see. And we need to understand who we're fighting. Isaiah 54, verse 17, the Lord says, No weapon formed against you, that's you and me, shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. When people say to you, you can't, you say, but God. But God. When they say to you, I've just come back from the hospital, and they say there's nothing more that they can do for you, you must go home, make yourself comfortable because you're going to die. You say, but God. When somebody says, your marriage has had it, it's finished, you say, but God. See? When somebody says, you will never, ever get your degree, you're too slow, but God. And that's how it works. But God. So, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue, you see, criticism is a terrible thing. Be careful how you talk to your children. You break them down, you know. You say, yeah, but I don't really mean it, Angus. I just do it in the, in the spur of the moment. I've heard it. You little devils, eh? and maybe they are acting badly. What are you doing? You're just speaking a curse over your children. Okay? I've heard some others say, I wish you'd die. Give me some peace. What are you saying? You're actually speaking death over your child. Don't do that. Right? Don't do that. Discipline them by all means. I'm all in favor of discipline. It's in the Bible. It's in the Word of God. But don't speak death over your family. Every tongue which rises against you in judgment, what do you do? You shall condemn, the Bible says. You do this, you see? You just brush it off. You know, you are the biggest loud mouth <laughs> I've ever met. I'm talking about me, right? You're so blim and ugly, you'll never make it, okay? Just do this. I am a creation of God. God created me. I never created myself. God gave me my personality. I might have a personality like Peter. I don't know. Like a bull in a china shop. Maybe that's what I am. But you know something? I'm using what I've got for God. I want to ask you a question. And I'm not being nasty. What are you doing for God? I find some of the biggest critics, the ones who have always got a lot to say, they're actually doing nothing. Isn't that true? They say, oh, you're, not very, you're not a very good sportsman. But they don't play sport. As one guy said, you've got 50,000 uh, referees in the stadium. And you've got 30 men playing rugby on the field. But all of these 30, they, they can all tell you how to play rugby, but they won't go on the platform, on, the stage, on the, the stage as well, yes, on the field, see? So don't listen to those negative words, because those are the things that will break you down. And so if we read what the word says, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn, okay? But God. This is the heritage. It's your inheritance. It's my inheritance. We are sons of God. We are not accidents. doesn't matter how you were born. doesn't matter if you've, you, you, uh, you've only got one uh, parent. It's not about that. God created you. You shall inherit what God has prepared for you. Just take it. Yeah, but I'm not good enough. Who says you're not good enough? Doesn't the Bible say, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me? Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. That's why you've got to get to know this book. This is the sword. This is the weapon which God has given to you and me to fight off the devil. Only this one. 
the word of God. The rest is armor for defense. This is your weapon. When the devil comes against you, you come against him with the word of God. What did Jesus do in the desert? Jesus, I'm talking about God made flesh, Emmanuel. What did he do? Did he sit there and start crying? No. When the devil tempted him, he said, it is written. It is written. What is in this book is written. It will come against the devil and he cannot stand against it. Your opinion he'll sort out. He, he feels nothing for that. But when you say the word of God says, see, then he's finished. I remember Dr. Billy Graham, one of my heroes. He'd be preaching away. And as soon as he says, and the word says, you could feel the presence of God coming down. It's the power of the spoken word that defeats the enemy every time. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. For their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. See, we can do nothing in our own strength. I don't know about you. I get so disappointed in myself many times. Lord, I spoke to some men just recently. And I, I quoted those scriptures that Paul said, Wretched soul that I am. What will become of me? I don't do what I should do, and I do what I shouldn't do. That is the, an, an apostle, in my opinion, who was the greatest of all the apostles. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and yet he can write that? Because of the pressure and the fight. But you know, Paul never gave up. He went right home to the destination, to his finish post. That's right. He never bucked the system. And he suffered more than any other man in the New Testament. Paul, the apostle. So, so, so maybe today, maybe today, the, the devil and his words have been knocking you down. And the accuser of the brethren has come in and he's making a mess of everything in your life. Well, I, I want to tell you something. One of my heroes in the Old Testament is the prophet Elijah. O oh, troubler of Israel, King Ahab said as they, saw, as they saw this prophet coming over the horizon. Can you imagine what he must have looked like, Elijah? He must have had fire in his eyes. He must have had hair that looked like a male lion's mane. Elijah wasn't scared of anyone. He took on 450 prophets of the devil, Baal or Baal. On the top of Mount Carmel. I go there every time I go to Israel. That's where the battle of all battles took place. They tell me, I'm not sure, but don't quote me, that Elijah is the patron saint of the Israeli army. That's right. He was an incredible warrior for God. Elijah. Now you can read all about Elijah. I'm not going to go there. In two chapters, 1 Kings... Chapter 18 and verse 19, after the program, go and look it up for yourself. He went up on that mountain and he challenged 450 prophets of Baal. Not just ordinary men, these were the prophets of the devil. And he said, let's see who's God today. Okay, if your God is God, then we'll worship him. If my God is God, that's the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, then we'll worship him. And what opinion will you be today? And he said that to the crowd and they never said a word. Isn't that terrible? I've experienced it in my own life. You know? When the pressure's on and the game is really getting hot, you look around for your friends. They're not there, are they? But Jesus is there. He says, I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. So let's see who God is. And of course, you know the story. They put the two sacrifices out. And uh, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, you go first. And they did all their dancing, and then if nothing happened. And then he was very rude, actually. He said, where is this God of yours? Maybe he's going to relieve himself. Maybe he's going to the bathroom. That's a fact. It's in the Bible. <laughs> and then, then they started cutting themselves with knives, and they were bleeding. Nothing came down from heaven. No fire. And then Elijah said, right, it's my turn. And he told them to stand back. He put the sacrifice on the wood. He said, bring water, and he doused the sacrifice. It was soaking wet. He dug a trench around the sacrifice. I've been there, folks. They filled it with water, okay, to think that this will never, ever catch light. Then he stood back and he called on the name 
of the Lord, our Lord, your Lord and my Lord. And fire came down from heaven and consumed that sacrifice instantly. He then took out his sword and he killed 450 men by himself. I want to say something to you. He was not a sissy. He was not a coward. He was not a compromiser. He was a man of God. He was a prophet of God. But this is not the point of the story. The point of the story is I'm still coming to. So he was an absolute victor. And then what do you read next? A woman. One woman. That's all. One woman. Her name is Jezebel. She was the wife of King Ahab. She said, I am going to get him. And what happened? He crumbled. He went into depression. He went into the desert. He wanted to die. One woman, he just killed 450 prophets of Baal. Okay? Single-handed. One woman said, I will get him. And he just fell apart. What I want to say to you is that we are fighting a battle. A battle of our lives. I want to tell you a couple of stories that's happened to me. You know, folks, sometimes just after a great victory, you have a devastating time. That's right. And it sounds, it doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, it's contrary to what you should be doing. When you should be celebrating, you're in the bottom of the barrel. And that's what happened to me once. You know, my dad and I had a very close relationship. My mom, I led her to Christ and also had the privilege of leading my father to Christ before he died. My mom went home to be with Jesus about seven years before my father died. And when my mom died, my dad stayed on his own in a little cabin behind my house. And I used to go up every afternoon and I'd sit there and we'd talk together. And he'd tell me all about his early days. He came from Scotland, my dad. At 18 years old, he came to South Africa. He was a blacksmith by trade. He was an incredible man. He was my hero. And we'd sit there and we would talk. But then my dad got sick. And within a few weeks, he died. And I was devastated. I really want you to know that. But, you know, I was busy at the time getting ready for a big campaign that was going to take place in East London on the eastern coast of South Africa. And it takes a lot of preparation, as you know, if you do any preaching. And we'd booked this hall. It's where they have the title boxing fights in South Africa. It's called the Orient Theatre. It's on the shores of uh, East London. It can sit about maybe just over a thousand people. And we did all our advertising. We did our, everything we needed to do. I was so busy, I didn't have a chance to mourn. I want to say something to somebody there. It's okay to, uh, to be bereaved. In fact, it's natural. In fact, you should do it. If somebody says, pull yourself together, don't listen to them. There's a time for mourning. You see it right through the Bible. I mean, David, they call the greatest king that's ever lived next to Jesus. When his little son died, the first one, he went into mourning. And after his son died, then he came out and he had a shave and he cleaned himself and put on cl clean clothes and then he carried on. And he said, because David was very close to God, he said, that son of mine will not come back here, but I will go to him. He already knew about eternal life. That was even before Jesus came to earth. So there's a place for bereavement. There's a place to be sad. There's a place to mourn. Well, I didn't allow myself to do that, you see, because I didn't have time. I was busy organizing this campaign for Jesus. The name of the event was Hope in Jesus. Well, it was an amazing week. It started on Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. And then we pack up and we go home. We don't want to do it on Sunday because people must go back to their churches. We saw healings. We saw people born again. We saw marriages restored. We saw God moving, sickness healed. And then I came home, and I'll never forget it. That's why I'm sharing it with you. I drove in the gate, and my dad had a little uh, Staffordshire Bull Terrier. We used to breed them. And this little one's name was Patches. <laughs> it was a female. It had one big black spot over its eye, and it was full of patches. And my dad loved that dog. And that dog, it was a little bitch, she loved my dad. And as I drove in, I'll never forget it, I drove into the shed with my, my car coming home, and there was Patches sitting on the step. 
waiting for my dad to come back. I just finished me. I hit a downer like you cannot believe. Now, I should have been rejoicing. There were souls coming into the kingdom every single night. People were being healed. Things were happening all over the place. I came home. I was done. It took me three months of spending time with God, spending time in the Word, using this weapon against the devil to get myself back into shape. Maybe you're there today. I'm going to pray for you at the end of this program. Maybe you say, Angus, I don't understand it. I'm so depressed. And I shouldn't be. I've got a lovely wife. Maybe it's my husband. I've got a lovely husband. I've got children. I've got work. And yet I'm so depressed. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The devil is going for your mind and your heart. That's right. It's not a physical battle. And he knows when he gets victory in your mind and your heart, he'll kill you. And he will kill you with his lies. I really want you to understand this. The devil has got no power to kill you physically. Okay? Because when Jesus died on the cross and he said, it is finished, he meant it. The devil's neck was broken on that day. The devil has got no power of you. Greater is he that is within you than he that's in the world. Who's in the world? The devil. Who's in you? The Holy Spirit. 1 John 4, 4. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. So what you've got to do, you've got to stand, because the battle is the Lord's. But you've got to use the weapons that he has given you. Remember two words, but God. When the doctor says, I can do nothing for you, you must go home, make yourself comfortable, because you're going to die. You say, excuse me, sir, but God. My God's a miracle working God. When you go out and you see that crop that you've planted in your fields, if you're a farmer, I've done this not once, many times. And, and some experts come, the um, agronomists and the, um, the, the different agents come and they say, your crop's done, it's finished. I mean, even if you get rain now, it's, it's beyond uh, redemption. You say two words, but God. I have sometimes seen the best crop I've ever had come out of a crop that was dead. I would not accept it. Okay? That child of yours that's been hooked up with drugs for so long, that child will never come right, but God. See? And that is the victory that we have. That is how we overcome the lies from the pit of hell. You see, this anticlimax that I'm talking about, we know where it comes from, but we don't always realize it. We think it's us. It's not you. I'm talking to a young couple that have just been married. That's right. And you were so excited, weren't you? You had the build-up. First of all, you proposed to your wife-to-be, and she accepted and that was huge. That was number one. Then you got all your wedding preparations organized. And then you got your little house or your flat or wherever you're going to stay. And the furniture and everybody came around and they were helping you. That's right. Yes. Then the big day came. That was amazing. Remember? I mean, she looked so beautiful. You've never seen her look that beautiful. And he looked so handsome. You've never, he looks like a film star. Right? And all the people were there and they were all dressed up. And you were the in the spotlight. You were the focus of everything. And then what happened? Then you went on your honeymoon. That's right. You'd saved up for that, hadn't you? You got on that plane and you flew off to that desert island and you had a most amazing honeymoon. And then you came back. That's right. And then what happened? All of a sudden, a huge anticlimax. Because you've got to go to work. And your spouse has got to go to work. And then you've got to start working through personalities and characters. And what do you do? Well, you know, you always presses the toothpaste <laughs> in the middle of the tube. And I don't like that because we are taught to press it from the bottom. So what? You know, and um, he's not, he doesn't get out of bed that early in the morning. You know, my dad used to be an early riser. So what? He works until midnight. And then sometimes you can have a terrible anticlimax. But that does not make any difference. The revival train is still going home. That marriage is cemented by God. You believe that. That's why you got married. And he'll see you through. You've got to work through it. How? With the Word of God. Praying every day. Reading the Bible together every day. And then your real union starts to form. It's not the froth and bubbles and all the stars and everything. No, no. It's the real thing. Maybe it's that degree. You've worked for years to get that degree. It's taken you seven years. Now you've got your degree. Anticlimax. So I've got it up on the wall. Now I'm a doctor, or now I'm a whatever. I'm an agronomist. Now I'm a lawyer. 
Ja, and so what? <laughs> now you've got to carry on living. That can bring you down. You see, instead of saying, now I can do this. What about the sports accolades? I remember a man in South Africa. He had three national blazers. Not one. In his order. Athletics, rugby, and there was something else. Three. And after he put the third one there, he was flat until he met Jesus Christ. And then he started to live. The birth of that baby. How long have you been waiting for that child? Yeah, well, they said we'd never have a child. That's right. But now your wife's pregnant. And you've got this little baby. And what happens? Your wife's taking strain. Why? You don't understand. It's that postnatal thing. Now, I'm not a doctor, but I know I had five children of my own. These are areas where there is intense spiritual warfare. And what happens is we, we tend to blame other people, you see, but it's not them. And it's not a problem. It's life. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. You see, the thief wants to steal from you. The thief wanted to steal from me the victory we had at that incredible evangelistic campaign by bringing depression onto me when I remembered what what happened with, with my dad? And when I saw that little dog sitting on the step, I mean, I was weeping uncontrollably. But I want to tell you something now. There are people that are in the kingdom of God today because of that campaign. And I've got to remember that. And my dad is safe in the arms of Jesus. I've got to remember that because I led him to the Lord and so is my mother. Now we start talking about victory. Instead of sitting in the corner and crying over spilt milk and saying, woe is me. Those words that people speak of you as well, you must deal with them. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that will rise up against you. You know, when I was at school, they taught me a little saying. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never harm me. Remember that thing? That is totally wrong. It's the other way around. If somebody hits you with a stick and even breaks your arm, it can be healed. But when somebody says something against you, it burns into your soul, especially if it's somebody that you love. And only the Lord can remove that. So you really need to stand against the thief. John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I came to give you life abundantly. So that's what we need to understand. We are in a war. This is not a skirmish. And what is, what is at stake? Your very life is at stake. And the lives of your children and your wife and your husband at stake. Now, how do we handle this? By the word. Okay? John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word. That's right. And the word was with God and the word was God. This is Jesus Christ in print. This. So if somebody says, show me this Jesus you're always talking about. Give them a Bible, a Bible that will change their lives forever. Because this Bible was, has saved many marriages. This Bible has given some men, businessmen, industrialists, new direction and made them multi-millionaires, this Bible. This Bible has healed the sick. This Bible has set the captives free. This Bible is a compass that shows you where to go. Some of you are walking around and around that mountain, aren't you? You can't keep doing that. Jesus is coming back. Go to the Word. How do you read it? Read it systematically, Old Testament and New Testament, and God will direct you home because Jesus is the Word. What you say is what you get. I just want to say to you, I'm going to pray for you in a short while. I just want to say to you, you need to guard your heart. Your heart is the wellspring of your mouth. So what's in your heart is what comes out of your mouth. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 4. The words of a man's mouth, are you listening, are deep waters. The wellspring of wisdom is a flowing brook. Now, if you're going to chuck rubbish into that spring, what's going to come out? Rubbish. So if you're spending most of your evenings watching uh, movies that are very, very on the borderline of being, you know, just, uh, just ugly, dirty films with obscene uh, scenes and filthy language, etc., 
I'm telling you, it will, it's going to come out of you. What you put in is what comes out, okay? And you need to really understand that, not in your mouth, of course, but in your mind. Jesus said that. It's not what you eat, told the Pharisees. No, it's not that. It's what comes out of your mouth. So if, you, if you're continually watching violent movies, for example, I've got no problem with boxing. I'm a man. I have no problem. But I don't, sp I don't spend my whole life watching boxing. But if you're watching some uh, horror movie of murder and killing, eventually it starts to affect your mind. You need to start watching movies that are wholesome, that are encouraging, that are godly. You need to start reading books of the, the great men and women of God. All of them went through tough times, just like you. All of them. All of them had a full-on battle with the enemy. And I want to say something to you, and this is not a negative. This is a positive. But the more God uses you, the more intense the battle becomes. I really mean that. And, yet, you know, when I was a new Christian, I used to think, wow, I can't wait until I get older because those guys, I can see they got it all together. No. I met an old man who mentored me. His name was Um Johannes Nell. He was an Afrikaans man. And I said to him one day, Um Johannes, I can't wait until I get to your age. Is it, is it so much easier? He looked at me in tears, filled his eyes. He said, Angus, the older you get, the harder it gets. The great uh, evangelist, John Wesley, who literally, through his ministry, changed the world. They said to him when he was in his 80s, what is your biggest challenge? What is your biggest enemy? He said, the lust of the flesh. Can you believe that? A man over 80, the lust of the flesh. Now, obviously, it's not, he wasn't talking necessarily about sexual things. He was talking about things like losing your temper, like getting bitter and twisted, by getting judgmental, all these things. That was what he was dealing with. So this battle continues, but we have the victory. And who's our example? Jesus. Jesus was tempted more than any man that's ever walked on the face of the earth. And yet he succeeded. He was resurrected. He's alive and he's with you through the power of the Holy Spirit today. He's coming. You know, I just want to say to you in closing, and this is my last story, and then I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to say goodbye. When I was a young man, I think I was 46 years old, I felt led by the Lord to go back to my roots, back to Scotland from South Africa, and to preach the gospel. And I took my oldest daughter with me, and I spent three months in Scotland. Three months, that's right. Now, you might say, oh, that's not long. Well, it was very long for me because I'm very close to my wife and my children. I'm a farmer. Every day when the sun goes down, I go home to my little house and I spend the time with my wife and my children. Now, for three months, I was separated. When I left this farm, there was no crop on the ground. When I came back, the crop was in full bloom because I had a partner. He did the farming. I did the preaching. And when I left, I want to tell you something now. I preached my heart out for three months. When I came back, I came back, I mean, it was amazing. God gave me a kilt, a Scottish kilt, which was a miracle. I never asked for one. And I asked him when I, before I left, I said, Lord, just as a sign, I want a kilt. And I want it to be the Bachan Tartan. That's my family Tartan. And I don't want to ask for one. I don't want to buy it. Lord, I want somebody to give it to me. And that's exactly what happened. A man with the same name as mine, his name was Robert Bachan. And he lived in a little village called Buchan Haven. Can you believe it? In Peterhead on the northeast coast of Scotland where we come from. My folks come from. So I, everything went so well for me. We saw people healed, born again, set in three months. I came home and I hit the all-time downer. That's right. Are you, are you listening to me? Are you relating to me? Please, because this will save you. I just couldn't understand what was wrong with me. I was supposed to be happy. But I felt like I was out of place. You see, Jill, my wife, she's a beautiful, beautiful lady. I'm the one, I'm the man of the house. I protect her. I put the food on the table. I take care of the accounts. I don't need to do that. But when I left, I had to give her signing powers. She started taking care of everything. I had my partner was doing the farming. Okay. I even had my little dog. I'm coming back to dogs again. <laughs> this dog would go nowhere with anybody, only me. I would walk out the door, get in my pickup, and the dog was with me. When I came home, okay, <laughs> my dog walked straight past me. And I had a young son, adopted son, 
that was living in the house. And he was driving my pickup, and the dog and my young son drove off together, and I was standing there by myself. Jill said to me, Angus, I'll see you just now. I'm just taking the children to school, and then I'm going to do some shopping and pay a few accounts, and I'll be back. I sat there all by myself. And I, I really felt, and the devil, of course, was putting the fire in. You are done and dusted. They don't even need you. They don't even need you. You are finished. Now, I just had an incredible campaign in Britain. I should have been rejoicing. Then I went to see an old gentleman, an old man. And this man was an evangelist, but he was in his 80s. And his name was Uncle Gerhard Ingelbrecht. He was a German, South African. And I said, Uncle Gerhard, I have to come and have a cup of tea with you. He said, yes, you're welcome. And I sat there with my cup of coffee. And I didn't know what to say to him, you know. The tears welled up. I said, Uncle Gerhard, I, I can't understand what's happening to me. I said, I'm supposed to be happy. I've had an incredible campaign. God has used me. I've seen people healed, people saved. I said, but I'm not happy. I'm, I'm devastated. I'm actually in depression. You know that that old gentleman never said a word. He just sat there and a smile came over his face. A smile of love and compassion and tears filled his eyes. He nodded his head. He said, I understand exactly what you feel like. You see, he'd been there. We're in a fight. We're in the fight of our lives. Now, maybe you're there today. You can't even understand it. Everything's going well for you, but you're just not happy. I want to tell you, the devil is trying to rob your joy. He's trying to take it away from you. You've worked so hard for it. And now it's not the Lord, it's the devil. The Lord doesn't bring depression on people. It's the devil who does it. And today we're going to put an end to it on the revival train. I'm going to pray for you and you're going to change. How am I going to do that? You're going to do it by spending time reading God's word. You're going to spend it by getting up in the morning and having a good quiet time. You're going to get your body, your physical body into shape. I don't care how old you are, sir. You're going to start training, eating properly, sleeping properly. You're going to watch out what you're watching on that TV. Any rubbish, you turn it off. And you are going to start talking. Life, not death. And you're going to say two words every time the devil will tempt you. But God, see? The devil says, you're done, you're washed up. But God. Your marriage will never work. But God. You're never going to get healed, but God. And so what we do, after we've said, but God, we pray. That's right. What is prayer? Talking to Jesus. We tell him all your problems. And he will say to you, it's okay, son. I understand. But do you really understand, Lord Jesus? Yes, I do. I was in a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. I was on my knees. I was begging my friends to come near me. They were all sleeping. I was so stressed out. That's the word, eh? So stressed out that I was sweating blood. That's right. And I even said to my father, take this cup from me. I can't handle this. And then I said, but not my will, your will be done. I want you to pray that same prayer with me. Not my will, but your will be done. And then you'll sleep well and you'll relax. Angus, I've made a mistake. Well, confess it, man. You, the devil's telling you now, you're the only one in the whole world that made a mistake. I have made so many mistakes. I've been like a bull in a china shop. Because of my nature and my personality, often I speak before I think, and it's not a joke. And I get myself into trouble. Then I cry out to the Lord, and He saves me. He did the same to Peter. Peter stepped out the boat. That's right. He walked on the water, and then he started sinking. But you know something? The others never got out the boat. And he cried out, Lord, and he said, I'm here. So you've made a mistake. Confess it as we pray now. Stand up, dust yourself off, right, and get back into the fight. You see, the best fighter is not the man that can deliver the punch. No, it's the man that can receive the punch and get up again. That's the winner. So we're going to pray. Just close your eyes with me. I don't know where you are. You might be in hospital. You might be in jail. I don't know where you are. You might be in a hostel at school. You might be at home on the farm. You might be in a little flat. You might be a widow. Pray this prayer with me and God will give you a game plan, which he's already given you, to defeat the enemy. Because he's a liar and he's a coward. You know what a coward is? When you confront him, he runs away every single time. And he's a thief. Okay? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, 
You can pray this prayer with me if you want. I want to say to you today, Lord, that uh, I have been fighting with the wrong weapons. I have been fighting with my ability, with my own physical strength, and most of all with my mind. And my mind has been playing tricks on me, Lord. People drive past me and I think they don't like me because they don't wave to me, but they can't see me because the sun is in their eyes. Please forgive me for that, Lord. I judge people. Some people don't look like they like me, but they, they are fighting their own battles. Lord, my patience. My patience has been letting me down. Please give me patience, Lord. And Lord, that temper, that ugly temper and that sarcastic way of talking, I want it out of my life, Lord, because it's not helping anybody. Today, I want to, Lord, start to confront the enemy with the word of God, just like your son, Jesus Christ, did in the desert, the Judean desert. And I thank you, Lord, for nothing less than a victory, a victory over the devil. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you next week on the revival train. Remember, greater is he who is within you than he that's in the world. 1 John 4, 4. Goodbye.